Hello everyone, let's start uh, our next talk, last one before lunch. Uh, uh, Martin Kraft invited Rommel to give our, us talk about, um, about how to better produce open software. Uh, and uh, let's keep questions for after uh, the main part of the talk, there will be enough time uh, for them. Rom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to be here, but um, uh, I said Martin, Martin heard me uh, give a talk in uh, LinuxConf AU and he said, oh, you should, you should come give this talk at DevCon. So I thought, ah, oh, this will be so exciting. And I, I came here and uh, Matthew Garrett gave it yesterday. <laughs> um, so, so I didn't know where to go from there. Um, uh, but I, so there were, Two things that I, I, I guess I should point out at Matthew's talk. I don't know if he's here today. The first is he was uh, he was uh, pointing out how he had been you know, c contrasting where things were today from where they were 20 years ago, and he pointed out that uh, you know one of the differences was that he was thinning on top. <laughs> <laughs> Behold the future, Matthew. Uh, secondly, uh, he. he, he posed a number of questions about why open source wasn't in free software hadn't met its objectives, which was kind of what I was going to talk about, uh, but he didn't have any answers, and so I'm here to tell you that I, I do have the answers. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the answers part, and uh, I was going to talk about the software engineering aspects, because I'm a software engineer, but, uh, but he did uh, talk about other problems like uh, revenue and, and whatnot, and even though I'm, I'm not an economist or a financier, I have played one on TV, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about that since I had the extra time. Um, Lou Gerstner, <clears throat> in, his, uh, in his book about the turnaround of IBM, talks, uh, it's called, uh, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance, chapter eight, I think he talks about strategy. He says, yeah, people overrate strategy. The strategy is obvious. Strategy is what everybody else in your industry doing, it's really the only thing that needs to be done, and so therefore uh, what differentiates uh, you know, people who succeed versus uh, people who don't succeed is not their strategy, but how they implement the strategy, because the strategy is obvious. So in the case of, um, you know, what do we do about, uh, about revenue um, in free software and open source software, the answer of course is fixing issue management. <clears throat> So why, why do I talk about fixing issue management? One of the things that came up, the question was asked when, uh, when Matthew asserted that you know, Windows was stabler than Linux, is you know, were there any studies for that? So, so the 2012 Coverity study, and they've been doing this for a long time, there's a, there's a bunch of other ones similarly, looking for bugs in proprietary software versus uh, free software, and found that the average defect density between thousands of lines of code between proprietary software and free software was the same. Didn't make much difference, but there was an interesting diversion in the results. And what was that diversion? The diversion is that as proprietary software projects get bigger, they get more robust, fewer bugs. And as free software projects get bigger, they get more defects per thousand which is to say, if you believe the data, free software doesn't scale. <clears throat> so how do we fix that? Now the thing is, we've known this all along. The reason we got here, in fact, is because uh, people have known this forever. In uh, February of 1983, uh, IBM started their OCO program. OCO was uh, Object Code Only. The way it used to work before that was, if you had a computer, it came with the source code to the operating system. It's true for all computers. Right? It was the way things worked. And IBM was in the business of selling the computers. They didn't mind giving you the source code to the software because it was good for their business. And then if, uh, if uh, there was a bug or something, you could fix it because you had the source code. And if you wanted to change the behavior of the operating system, you had the source code, you could fix it. You could add your features yourself. And people did this for a long time, but as more and more people started using computers, they kind of kept wishing that IBM would do all the fixing instead of them. And so they said, IBM, you know, would you, would you fix this 
for us, uh, we'll pay you. We want to pay you. We want to give you money to fix the bugs in the software. We think that's reasonable because we don't want to do it ourselves. And IBM said, well, the problem is you've been fixing it. So everywhere we go, people had the software, they had the, you know, they had the source, and they modified it. We can't be responsible for the stuff that you modified. We don't know what you did. Right? That would, that would potentially be an infinite cost. So, what we're willing to do is we're willing to take your money to fix the software if you promise not to change it. And IBM Institute Object Code only. We'll just ship you the object code, and that way if there's a problem, we'll fix it. And to this very day, right, that is uh, Red Hat's model. Right? And we said, and so now the difference between free software and open source software, of course, the free software people said, well, we know that if you have free software, it's not going to scale as well as proprietary software. So the software you're going to wind up with is going to be of lower quality. But we're okay with that because we want the freedom to modify it ourselves. So the freedom is worth the lower quality. And the open source people said, no, 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 no. <clears throat> this, this open model of software development is a better engineering practice. Um, and it sounded reasonable. You know, more eyeballs make bugs shallower, and it turns out it's not true. Right? We learned this with things like shell shock and heart bleed, um, that in fact, all of those eyeballs don't solve the problem. Um, and so, Again, we've known this forever. I, I highly recommend this, uh, this book, The Handbook of uh, Software and Systems Engineering. Um, it was, came out in 2003, so it may be getting a little dated in sections, but, uh, but it's a great collection of resources and whatnot about software engineering. And so one of the things is, if you think about how many eyeballs do you need to make bugs shallow, there was, uh, there was actually some research done on that. It turns out you know, one of the results of research is uh, code inspection is more cost effective than testing in order to identify bugs. So everybody knew this, and that's why you know, being able to look at the source code was a good thing. But then secondly, the number of eyeballs that is the sweet spot is six. That is, if you have three people look at it, you find the most number of bugs for, you know, for, the, for the cost involved. And as you add more people to look at it, you actually just don't find that many more bugs. Not worth it. So, it is not true that more eyeballs make bugs shallower. It is true that up to six eyeballs uh, bugs get shallower, and then after that, it stays pretty much the same. So, to fix the revenue problem, and getting back to uh, Gerstner's point about what should the strategy be, well, to increase revenue, you should charge for something. <laughs> or, if you're, if you're an overachiever, right, you should charge for some things, right? And uh, the first pushback that uh, you get when you talk to a crowd of people at some place like uh, Debian is, well, but, you know, we're a nonprofit, right? We want to, this is more about a community thing and a charitable thing, right? Why should we charge for stuff? So I, took the trouble of Googling for, you know, can a, can a 501c3 charity charge for stuff? And the answer is 72% of charitable income is earned by charging for stuff. Just because you're not trying to make a profit doesn't mean you don't charge for what it costs to do stuff. So what, 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 should, what should a free software project charge for? Well, again, if you go back to the GNU Manifesto back in Stallman lays out when people talk about, oh, this will never work because programmers won't be able to make money. He says, no, 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 there's lots of ways that you could make money, right? And one of the ways that you could make money is you could charge for distribution services. Another way you could make money is you could charge for, you know, feature requests and fixing things. So the proposal is, and it's very simple, is uh, be able to charge for stuff. So how do we do it? Well, the easy one for this crowd, starting from the bottom up, is every time you do apt get, Charges your credit card for 99 cents, just like the App Store. And the reason I thought of this, uh, and I don't know if she's here, I was talking to somebody, uh, Valerie, uh, about, you know, why, why, why does that mean new packaging? Like, what's the point of packaging? And so we had this discussion, and it was technical. But at one point, she said, well, it, it, it's kind of like the App Store, right? It's a signal. The fact that it's been packaged by Debian is kind of the stamp of approval, right? Kind of like what Apple does with the App Store. They say, if you made it into the App Store, Apple has reviewed 
reviewed it, and you know, same thing for the Android store. You know, somebody has reviewed it, and 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 so you can kind of trust it. Well, that's worth something, right? So there's lots of ways that you could charge for this. You could charge for the people who are trying to put it in, or you could charge for the people who are trying to get it out. Um, but um, but you should build that in. So if apps should have that capability. You know, take one of those open source micropayment systems and build it into app. And the thing is, it doesn't force you to charge for stuff. Right? For those people who feel that they don't want to charge for stuff, that it should remain free as in beer, then set your price to zero. That's okay. But for those people who think, well, you know, a buck's not too much to, you know, to ask, do that. The more interesting one is, uh, is uh, maintenance, right? It's charging for bug reports or feature requests. Um, and the solution to that, also equally obvious, um, but a little history again, when I first started using uh, version control systems, uh, back when I had hair, um, there was, um, the one that we used was called Razor, it's a proprietary system, but what Razor had, a feature that I've always missed ever since because nobody else has had that, was in order to commit your software, you had to provide the issue number against which you were doing the commit. The theory being, if there was no issue, why were you committing changes? And this, this is not a re reduction of my freedom. If I want to go in and make a change and there's no issue, I, I, I can write an issue and say, this is the issue that I have. And, and by the way, here's the commit that fixes that issue that I had. You know, closes the loop quite nicely. All right, so the solution for the charging part is, um, if commits have to be associated with issues, so that you have to have the issue in order for the software to advance, a charge for the issue. And there's a number of different ways of doing that. Um, and again, as with the other one, it could be purely optional. Your charge could be zero, in which case it doesn't matter. But when somebody files a bug report, it's like, you know, <laughs> we need your credit card number for this. And when somebody commits a change to it, you're going to get charged. And you can revenue share in a free software thing. So whoever it is that does the commit gets the revenue. And uh, you know, the best people to implement this, of course, is GitHub. Uh, because, you know, they're collecting people's credit card information anyway, a lot of projects are over there, and, you know, they can take a 10% cut, they can make a fortune on this thing just by doing it, but it doesn't have to be GitHub, it could be GitLab, it could be Launchpad, it could be Bazaar, like anybody could implement this notion, and again, so the notion is the capability should exist to charge for stuff, and if the capability existed, then some people might choose to charge for stuff, and it would still be a charitable work, communities involved, just getting paid for their efforts, and possibly not even getting paid what it's worth, right? I don't know, a buck just to weed out uh, people who are spamming you with all kinds of things that they really don't care about. Um, so yeah. If everybody here just wrote an email to GitHub saying, oh, you know, we'd really like the feature to be able to set a price for what it is that we would like to, to, to charge for, for closing a uh, bug report. And we could set it to zero, and the default could be zero, but you know, it's like, could you add that feature? Enough people I asked that would add the feature and the people could do it. Anyway, that's not what I came here to talk about. Because that's finance, that's funding, that's money. I don't want to talk about money. I'm not a, not a money guy, I'm a computer guy. So what I came here to talk about was how do we fix it so that free software is not of lower quality than proprietary software. What, where did we go wrong in the engineering department so that that should be true? And the solution, of course, is uh, just eliminate all dependencies. Right? Software should not have dependencies. Dependencies are a bad thing. Dependencies are what we used to call tech debt. Right? If you have dependencies, then your software is of lower quality. And free software, open source software, exacerbated this problem no end. Because in the ancient times, uh, if you had software and you wanted to do dependencies, right? so you wanted to include some other stuff, you had to pay for it. So you chose your spots wisely. You picked one or two or three things that you really needed lift, and then you use those one or two or three things. Uh, but when the software became free, we ran into Jevons' paradox. Um, Jevons' uh, you know, paradox is, is, is an economist thing. Uh, 
William Stanley Jevons was a British economist who in 1865 made an observation about the, uh, the energy uh, markets, uh, which at that time was mostly coal. And the observation he made was, as the price of coal came down, people spent more money on coal, which was a paradox. Presumably, if you made the resource less expensive, then you know, people should be able to save money on that thing. So what it turned out is it was even, so the counter argument was, well, you know, if I have a hundred dollar budget for coal and you know, so I pay a buck a pound for coal and you know, I spend my hundred dollars and then coal becomes 50 cents a pound, it's like, oh, I still have my hundred dollar budget, so now I buy 200 pounds of coal and that makes sense. But what actually happened was people would spend $150 on coal, right? To say, like, oh, since it's so cheap, it must be a better value. I should do more of this instead of the other things that I would have been spending my money on because this thing is a great value. And that's Jevons' paradox. And that's what happened with software. As it got free, we wound up using more software than we had used hitherto simply because it seemed like such a bargain. But there are hidden costs. So unfortunately, I gave you the, the, the reference to, uh, to Andres and Rombach's book, because uh, the, the other great source of information around this kind of stuff was the C-Base out of uh, Pittsburgh, the Center for the Empirically Based Software Engineering, uh, which unfortunately is defunct, doesn't exist anymore, but they used to put out a great you know, bunch of stuff. Uh, so this is from an article that they put out in 2001, where they were looking at um, COTS. COTS is a commercial off-the-shelf software. But this is basically the notion of rather than writing everything yourself, you should use stuff that you can get in the marketplace. And so they're talking about proprietary, but, but the principles presumably um, uh, also work for free software. Like you, you go out, you get a bunch of stuff, and then you incorporate it. So CBS, which starts with A, is actually a recursive acronym. The C stands for COTS, which stands for commercial off the shelf. Right? So CBS is COTS based software. It <laughs> uh, doesn't seem like you need all that level of. Uh, of uh, uh, acronymity, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so the point being, one of the, the observations that they make is that if you have n moving parts when you're engineering a solution, then you have n squared possible interactions, and uh, you know, in the best case, right, assuming that they're not three-way interactions, which might be coming into play if you just have two-way interactions. So, um, so as you add more uh, components to this thing, the cost scales super linearly, uh, possibly quadratically. Uh, and again, he quotes from uh, Garland et al. in 1995, pointing out that the sweet spot is four. Four can be too many, maybe three. Right? And it, uh, <coughs> so they, they have a whole bunch of stuff in this article. The other, the other thing they point out is, by the way, is if you get, you know, if, if you're doing what they call glue code, which is you take two pieces of software, and you sort of go to integrate them, and you have to write the code that glues them together, and then you look at the effort involved. The glue code takes three times more effort per line of code to write than the original code. So if you have like 100 lines here and 100 lines there, and then you write 10 lines to glue them together, the cost of that 10 lines is like you have to write 30 lines of code. Um, and, and, and if you wind up doing a lot of glue code, you're actually possibly better off not having the components and just rewriting that function yourself, because that is less effort than trying to glue them together for a variety of reasons. So I recommend them. But the particular paper to read, if you're only going to read one thing on this subject, is Software Components, Only the Giants Survive by Butler Lampson. Um, and the reason I quote this one is because, uh, you know, Basili and Baum did a lot of great work, but they're not that famous. Um, whereas Lampson got the Turing Award and arguably is the person who invented the personal computing and distributed computing. So, well, that's what he got the Turing Award for. Um, so it's a great paper, besides. Uh, the, the start of the paper is, uh, at the 1968 NATO conference, Doug McElroy proposed that a library of software components would make programming much easier. Since then, many people have advocated and worked on this idea. Often it is called reusable software, though this term has other meanings as well. This paper explains why these ideas don't work. Um, so, if you get a bunch of dependencies, a bunch of software components, and you aggregate them, and you try to reuse them, and you try to build stuff on top of them, right, there's a great deal of literature that says that cannot possibly work. And uh, free software introduced Jevons' paradox 
to encourage everybody to do stuff that way. So why doesn't it work? His outline is basically, well, when you go to write something that's going to be reusable, it's got to have all of these properties that the software that you would have written had it not been reusable is not going to have. Right? So you want the thing to be portable to a bunch of different environments. The person who actually needs the software only needs it to run there. So if I'm using Debian, I need my software to run on Debian. I don't need it to run on Red Hat because I don't do Red Hat. But if I'm writing something that's more general, other people can use, I, I have to worry about that. Right? If I want to run on Windows, then I have to worry about that. Now I have like, lots and lots of code. And now because that's also complicated now, I need a much bigger testing infrastructure and a lot more cases. And so that gets much more complicated. And then I need more documentation for how does it work and what you know, the things are. It needs to be configurable differently for different environments and so forth. So you wind up with if there's 10 lines of code that you need, out of a package, and you import that package, you're bringing along a thousand lines of code that you don't need in order to solve all these problems that you don't have, somebody else has. And that's sort of the, 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 the thrust of the argument that, uh, that it's in fact uh, kind of like a 10 to 1 ratio. You need to be using more than 10% of the functionality, and it turns out most people aren't using 10% of the functionality when they include other components. Um, and that because then, if it's a small enough component, it's not worth writing the documentation, doing all these test cases and whatnot, um, the thing can't survive, it's not viable, you shouldn't use it, and if you do use it, you're in for a world of hurt. And that's kind of the point of, uh, of his talk. Now, he does point out that large components are the biggest success in software engineering, uh, so things like uh, a browser, the renderer, right, a web browser thing, that's like a huge component or a SQL database, right? Um, his cutoff in this paper, which was uh, written in 1999, is five million lines of code. If it's less than five million lines of code and you think you need to include it, eh, you probably don't. You're probably better off just rewriting the functionality that you thought you would have gotten by doing that because that component isn't going to survive anyway. You're going to have to rewrite it when it dies. So you might as well start, you know, it's like if it's more than five million lines of code, it's, you know, probably will be useful. Now again, that was 1999, where 20 years later, the hair has gotten thinner on top, and so, uh, you know, I, I set the bar today at, I don't know, 20 million lines of code. The thing you're looking at doesn't have 20 million lines of code, you should just probably rewrite the bits that you need. So, how do you do that? Well, uh, Google actually invented a word for this, they call it vendoring. So if you have dependencies, vendor dependencies means copy the code into your repo. Don't make it a dependency, make a copy. Um, in the 1980s, this used to be called <coughs> white box reuse. So there's two kinds of reuse when people are arguing about you know, whether software reuse is a good idea. Black box reuse and white box reuse. The black box reuse was, oh, you reuse this stuff, like it's a black box, you can't peer inside of it. White box reuse is, well, you get the source code, yeah, copy it now, now you can sort of change it and muck with it because you, know, you can see inside the box the white box. Um, So, now, vendoring it pretty much means take the whole project and copy it in. You don't have to do that, right? One of the things that free software did that you couldn't have done with uh, proprietary software is, since you can go in and look in there, if, in fact, like, you know, you need, you need a SHA-1 algorithm, right? You don't have to include all of OpenSSL for that or OpenSSH, right? You just find the function that does that and copy that over and then you're done, right? Save yourself a million lines of code. Um, so, suck in all these dependencies and then code golf. Everybody know what code golfing is? Anybody not know what code golfing is? Oh, okay, so, so golf is one of the few sports in which the lower your score, the better, right? So you want the fewest number of strokes to win. So the idea of code golf, which again goes back to the 80s, was given that you have some problem, some, some algorithm that you're trying to solve, right? And you write the code to do that and, and, and Stephen Levy covers this in his book, Hackers, sort of the, sort of the, the genesis of the, the hacker culture at MIT in the uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Um, you figure out a way to solve this algorithm, and it's, you know, in the book he's talking about assembler code, now we, you know, we think about some other you know, higher level programming language, and it takes you 100 lines of code to solve that problem. Then, if you look at it for a bit, play a little golf, see if you can figure out how to do it in 80 lines of code, same thing. Right? It solves the same problem. It's like the 80 line of code solution is better than the 100 line of code solution. You have reduced strokes. You have practice to the point where you can now sink the putt, right? sink the ball into the hole with only 80 
strokes instead of 100 strokes, and you can keep playing this game, see like, you know, how, what's the smallest number of lines you can do to do this, right? And, you know, there are rules as, as in golf, I mean, there's, you know, certain things are considered cheating, like I guess, you know, if it were in C, in theory, you could put everything on one line, because the, you know, the white space, the carriage returns are optional, but, you know, that would violate the spirit of the whole thing. I mean, what you're really looking for, even though people do it in terms of lines, it was easier to see when you were doing it as, uh, what do you call it, uh, assembler code, because then it was number of instructions. But yes, the number of strokes, if you will. So the, the number of statements might be a, a better way of phrasing it, the number of lines of code. Um, so my objective here, oh, there's Keith. So Keith is fond of saying about Rommel that whenever Rommel proposes a solution, you can be certain that if you do something else, that's the right answer. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to convince you that this is the right answer, because I know it's the right answer, but you're not going to be convinced by me telling you this. So the purpose of this talk is to exhort you to try this yourself right? <clears throat> on one of your own projects. So I tried it on one of my own. I had, a, I had, a, uh, I had this uh, project. It was, uh, it was some uh, mobile app, uh, which I started with. 57,000 lines of code, code plus four dependencies. And the four dependencies had transitive dependencies. You know, they brought in other stuff. And so if you walk the transitive tree, it wind up being 12 thing, you know, 12 dependencies that, kept, that, that, that got brought in. And I didn't count the number of lines of code, you know, that that, that, that consisted of. But I started with this thing. I said, let me start removing the dependencies. So copy over the bits that I need and delete it as a dependency. Uh, so this is much easier to do if you're using some kind of language that has, uh, that has typing. Because what you could just do is sort of delete the import statement and <laughs> see what the compiler gives you as a error messages, and that's what you gotta know, you gotta fix or copy over. It's a little harder if you're doing something like uh, Python, but, uh, but it, you know, Python 3 now, you could, you could, you could do type hints and whatnot, so, uh, you know, and, there, and there's, some, there's some IDEs that, that, that'll point out things that are defined and whatnot, so uh, it, it, it's, it's a doable thing. But at any event, uh, so I removed, I started removing dependencies, copying over the code that I needed and then doing a little bit of golf on them. And so I started with 57,000 lines of code and 12 dependencies, and when I was done, I had 57,000 lines of code and zero dependencies. Because, the way we do software development inherits patterns of software engineering that were developed in a world where there was proprietary software and it was a given that you were not going to be able to peer inside the black box of somebody else's software. And so therefore, if you were trying to build reusable software, you had to do certain techniques. And the thing about those inherited patterns is if you live in a world where free software is the default, as Matthew said yesterday, then those techniques are no longer appropriate. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's think about Apache. Right, so Apache comes along first. It's still the days of proprietary software. How do you write software if you want it to be configurable? You have to have some kind of dynamic loadable scheme because if I want to add my own features into it, it's not like I can go modify the source code. Right? I need to have this well-defined API where I can write my source code separately and then have it dynamically loaded. So Apache is engineered around that same concept. And you have this notion of loadable modules that, that you know, can be loaded at runtime and the people writing the modules don't need to communicate with the people who are writing the, you know, the base web server. But of course, in a free software world, I could in fact go in and stick my functionality right into the source code of the thing. Right? I don't need to have that dynamically loaded modules, and when Nginx comes along much later, it's also an open source project, and it says, if you want functionality in there, you have to compile it in. But hey, you got access to the source code, so go crazy. Right? And what you wind up with is a thing that has much, much less overhead, right? and is stabler, and is faster. Right? So Nginx has been making, over the years, traction you know, against Apache. Uh, um, primarily because it sort of fits the model better. Um, another case uh, of, of, um, is this notion of build pipelines. Right? I found that 
And I still find that hard to wrap my head around because I grew up in a world where software didn't get built. And so I'm still struggling to do that. And, 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 and the world of software is changing to almost go back to the way things were in 1981. So I'm very excited. Right? Uh, and what I mean by that is I grew up in a world where software, uh, source code wasn't in files. Right? The advanced software development environments were image-based. Right? Today we would call it a container. Right? You were in this container and you modified the code that did stuff and the code was memory resident and you modified the memory resident code to do different things and then when you wanted to checkpoint your work, you checkpointed your, your memory image wrote out your current state of your container, or your VM, right? And then when you wanted to come back to it later, you could just load that and keep going. Right? And if somebody said, well, where's your source code? It's like, I don't know what you mean by source, right? My code is in, you know, my image where it belongs, right? And this was true of Smalltalk, it was true of APL, it was true of Lisp back in the day. So the reason Smalltalk and APL didn't survive is they still work that way. The new release of Dialog APL, which just came out last month, that's the feature they added. They said it is now possible to have your APL code in a operating system text file. So I was, you know, I thought, wow, you know, the worlds are converging and everybody else is building containers, so you don't have to keep all of your code in files because you can put it in a big blob. Uh, anyway, where was I? Ah, yes. Okay, so if you have no dependencies, there's not a whole lot to package, right? Go Lang took this approach. That's kind of, kind of pretty much their approach. You write your stuff in Go, it spits out a static executable, and then you're done, right? You copy that onto the machine that you want to run it on, and it runs, right? There's no such thing. So if you want a configuration file, you bake it into the executable, right? If, in fact, what really impressed me was it's the only thing that will produce a static executable on Mac. 10, because Mac OS 10 in the documentation says you cannot do static executables, so you have to uh, link against uh, the, the system libraries, the system libraries are only made, you know, the equivalent of libc is only made available as a dynamic library, so you will always wind up with a dynamic linked executable, at a minimum because you need to do that, and the Go people reverse engineered the entire system library, they don't use the libc on any platform, they generate that internally themselves, so when you, when you produce your Go executable, it runs as a static binary, even on Mac OS X, even though that's the documentation says that that cannot be done. Anyway, so, so that's the recommendation. Figure out how to write your stuff with no dependencies. I was, I was in the uh, OpenStack boss the other day, they were talking about the work that they had to do now, which was to take 400 Python packages, which were dependencies of, of, uh, of OpenStack, and, and repackage them because they used to be part of this one package, and now they wanted to be part of this other package. So, 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 so this is the kind of stuff that Butler Lamson was talking about, right? You have this, you, you think you save time by doing that, and then you have this maintenance burden that requires dozens of engineers working over years to sort of constantly manage this tech debt that you've created because you have all dependencies. Um, so, so yes, uh, no dependencies, no dependency help. That's uh, pretty much the, uh, the thing. So, uh, so lastly, code golf. I was talking about uh, doing some golfing. You know, what, kinds of what, 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 what kinds of things am I talking about? Well, they're very simple things, really. Um, so you could do uh, combining files. Uh, yeah, if you have two files, you don't have to have two files, make it into one file, you know, that's a win. Because one of the things that happens when you do that is then you can start uh, noticing uh, which things are being, you know, never called. You can inline functions that are called in one place. And what I mean by that is you have something that looks like this. You define a function f, it does a bunch of stuff, then it calls g, and then you define the function g, and it does a bunch of stuff. And uh, if you delete those four lines, it works exactly the same for the case where G is uh, you know, only called in that one place. Now, you would be surprised how often this happens, right? The reason you don't spot it is because G isn't defined under F like that. But if you reorganize the code, start looking for these kinds of things, right? You can, you can actually uh, find that that occurs a surprisingly large number of times. Um, and then, 
Of course, once you've done things like vendoring things, code that you didn't write, but you sort of copy the whole thing in, if you start looking for, are there functions here that I actually never call? And the answer is yes, there are, because you know you sucked in this other code, and it turns out that you know the, 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 the Windows compatibility stuff you're not using, so you know you can delete that, and, and then you start deleting stuff, and then those things call other things, which now that you've deleted them, they no longer get called anywhere. And then pretty soon the you know, whole thing squeezes down. Um, so, so, you know, I, I would recommend uh, studying code golf as, um, as the way to proceed. So that, that really was my talk, is figure out how to get rid of your dependency, start practicing, pick a small dependency, get rid of it, see if it increases your code bulk. Uh, my assertion is it will not. Uh, and then once you've actually brought in all your dependencies, now you have a code base, which is just your code, which you understand better. And now you can start code golfing. That, that 57,000 line program that I was talking about is now down to 2,800 lines. And I made 50 some bucks, so I'm going to have to probably add some more in. So I'll probably pop back up to 3,000, maybe 3,500. But given that I started at 57,000, I think it was, uh, it was pretty good. So this, and if you have one tenth the amount of code, you are going to have, on average, one tenth the amount of bugs. And particularly in the free software world, where we know that the bigger your code gets, the worse your defect density gets. As you bring the code size down, your defect density goes down. And so it's a win, 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 win. And that was uh, trying to leave time for questions, because I suspect that there might be some questions or disagreements or whatnot. And in that case, we're not going to have enough time potentially to do all of them here, but I'm making myself available for the rest of the day to people in the hallway track who want to continue this discussion. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I will take questions now. If you have questions, slide behind the microphone. Um, it was quite interesting, but uh, I think I disagree a bit because uh, not all defects are equal. So, for example, if you have security issues and just copy the code, then you won't notice security fixes to the code that, uh, code that you copied, and you will have, have to deal with the security fixes uh, yourself. Maybe mm -hmm. examples are that whatever a FreeBSD bug uh, reappears in iOS two years later, and so on. Um, yes, yeah, so the, uh, the you won't find you won't get the security patches. Uh, that is, thank you. Always the first question, um, and uh, so a couple a couple of ways to react to that. One, um, so an interesting thing about security vulnerabilities is they only go after the ones that are widely deployed. So if I were to write, and I know you're not supposed to do this, but if I were to write my own SSH. I'm less worried about security vulnerabilities because what hacker is going to spend hours, days, months trying to figure out how to find some memory vulnerability in this open SSH library that I'm the only one in the world using, right? It's possible that they might if I'm a big enough company, but um, so that's the first thing is that the diversity makes that harder. It's thing one. Thing two, um, the thing about I don't want to gore anybody's ox in the room, but, but what I heard in some of the boss that I was attending is one of the biggest complaints that people have about Debian is it takes so long to get updates and patches and fixes through the whole process so that people can upgrade. So, so it's the same argument that, that can be used for why one shouldn't use Debian, right? It's, a, it's true that it takes longer with Debian than with other distros, but there are advantages that sort of compensate for that. And then thing three, of course, is the boss that I was sitting in on was the Python buff discussing whether or not Python 2 should be moving to Python 3 and whether 10 years was long enough time to wait before doing that. And the answer is apparently 10 years is not long enough. Um, so, so in that context, what I would say is um, there are a lot of places that have that problem and I don't know that by vendoring this software it makes it better or worse. So again, my encouragement to you is, and it might make it worse, but my encouragement to you is, uh, again, practice doing it, see how painful it is, see what the benefits are, see how much code you reduce, because again, when you're including some other package that has bugs and vulnerabilities, many of those bugs and vulnerabilities are in places that you're not using, 
right? So it's you know the Windows implementation or the BSD implementation, and you're using the Linux implementation. It's different somehow. And thirdly, oftentimes those bugs are introduced by things like buffer management, right? Which is like, and the reason that library had to implement buffer management is because it's they were operating system agnostic, rather than take advantage of whatever the built-in facilities were for that. It's like, oh, we have to you know, manage our own buffers and, and do that. Whereas if you step back from that, um, uh, potentially you'll need that buffer management code, which is where the bug would have been because you know, you, you're managing buffers differently for some other reason. And lastly, the solution to that problem is to use a better programming language that has more software engineering modern support involved. So instead of writing the stuff in Python, if you were writing it in Rust, or you were writing it in Swift, or you were writing it in in Java, you might be better off. So, 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 so yes, it, what, what I would say is, you know, people, I, I often get that question from PHP programmers, right? <laughs> and, and, and I don't quite know how to respond. <laughs> um, so, it's a, it, it's a potentially valid point, but again, my, my exhortation is try it and see if the benefits don't outweigh that risk. Uh, so, I'm not sure what the, how, how one does ordering here. Yes. Um, so uh, I do quite a lot of work in Ruby, and uh, in the Ruby community, vendorizing is a really hot, hot thing. And one thing they did is they have their own tool called Bundler to manage dependencies and lock spe spe specific versions of external libraries. Containers can be seen as an another approach to do the same thing, and don't you think that's a real issue that we should just get better at managing vendorization and technical debt and switching dependencies when we need when we want to, instead of just uh, being the, the victim of uh, version changes? Um, yes, yeah, so, so that, and, and I, that's why I, I had a bit of trepidation to, to, to bring this thing up with Debian, which, which arguably is all about packaging lots of dependencies together. That's sort of like the main activity. Um, so what I would argue is, in a world where these dependencies couldn't be merged because they were proprietary software, and so you had to figure out how to package them. That made sense. Then in a world where you had license pro proliferation, and you had all these different licenses, and you didn't know what the licensing regime was to mix this software, so you might have incompatibilities, that made sense. And then when you got to a world where there was a large enough base of software using the same programming language, now what you are doing is you're building arguments. So if you buy the thesis, right, that having all of these dependencies is inferior software engineering, now what you're trying to do is say inferior software engineering and build layers on top of that in order to solve the problem where a simpler solution is don't, you know, don't do that part, right? It's like first we're going to build a castle in the sand and then we're going to figure out how to put a containment around it so that it doesn't melt, right? And what I'm saying is, is that's been the approach that we've been taking, and we haven't stepped back all the way to Ab initio to say, aha, the, the, the reasons why we started down this path no longer apply, and we should try it. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy for you to believe that I'm wrong, but rather than try to containerize all this stuff, on top of that is, hey, what if you start with whatever the thing is and start figuring out how to remove all the dependencies, so what you wind up with is a program that does what it is that you want it to do with no dependencies, and does that feel better? So that's, and, and, and it's a skill, and, and, and you'll feel good, but, but I haven't done that. <laughs> I'm not sure that I agree with your um, assertion about um, diversity means your, your like security vulnerabilities are no longer relevant because mm -hmm. you're not widely enough deployed. Um, I'm, I would rather, I'm not sure that that is compatible with um, the idea of uh, vendoring stuff in. But it's like, if, if your code is genuinely, genuinely diverse, fine, maybe your argument mm -hmm. uh, works pretty well there. But if what you have is like a modified copy of a bit of cell or mm -hmm. whatever, yep. um, I could see it being pretty difficult for that to result in enough diversity that you are not vulnerable to pretty much the same attack as the next clone of OpenSSL. Yep. So, so well, I've seen this a lot with um, forks of the Quake 3 engine, yep. for example. Yep. So, so you have to be committed, uh, as I am. And so when, when, when I got into a situation where I needed to, to tunnel up with OpenSSH in my program, and I said, uh, let, me, let me just um, I said, no, I'm not. So 
that one is hard. That was the hardest one that I, that I attempted, but I did figure out how to do it. Um, so because what happens is when you, when, you, when you go to do that, then it's like, a, turns out the biggest difficulty is when you include open SSHs uh, and you try to vendor that in and not have any of its dependencies, you find out you need big numbers, right? And so the particular thing that I was doing was I was trying to import the C thing into a Swift library. So I had to port all the C code into Swift, and then I had these sub-dependencies, which was like, you know, BN, and that actually was the one that took more time than the, uh, getting the big num stuff right, which actually took more time than getting the, the crypto stuff right. Um, but, but in my case, since I was committed, and since I was taking the C code and tra transliterating it into Swift and then fixing it in Swift, I'm pretty sure that whatever I wound up with in Swift wasn't the same thing. So you're right, crypto code of the ones that you can do are the hardest. I do not recommend that you start with crypto code when you start doing this. Uh, in, 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 in your application, pick one of the non-crypto libraries to do first, um, and second and third, but, but you know, when, when you get up to like your 10th or 11th time that you're doing this, I'd actually go after some of the crypto libraries, because it turns out that once you prune away all the stuff that you don't need to say, I just needed to do an SCP, right? And so if what you're doing is, is you're, you're, you're adopting this as, as a plan to, I'm trying to write my thing and have no dependencies, why do I need OpenSSH? I need OpenSSH because I need to do SCP. What do I need to do SCP? Turns out I don't need 80% of OpenSSH, right? And, and especially, and so I would encourage you to do this as well, switch programming languages, right? So it's a, you're running in Swift and then you call an, a, a C library that's allowed, right? You're writing stuff in, 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 in C Sharp, you can call C libraries. You're writing stuff in Python, you can call C libraries but then switch to the, mm, I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my own copy of it. And in, in the case of Python, you have Paramico, right? So you can just like copy the bits of Paramico that you want, and I don't know that there are a lot of, you know, how much vulnerabilities people have found in Paramico because, because they're actually trying to hack the organization. So I take your point, crypto is hard, don't start there, it's, you know, it's, it's for the advanced section only, but you'll be able to satisfy yourself whether the rest of my thesis um, make sense up to the crypto boundary. Um, and, you know, if, if you agree with me until that point, then we can have a follow-up meeting in which we discuss how we, how we cross the crypto divide. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> I, so, can't, I can't sound entirely convinced. Okay, but, but I'm willing to compromise and say take rid of all your dependencies except the crypto ones. And, and I'll consider that a win. Okay, but then the same argument applies uh, to network protocols, to file, st file formats, etc. At the same, you don't want, if you have to, to write a web application, you don't want to have to write uh, a web server at the same time. No? Yeah, no, those are very when, easy. When do you make the... Uh, yeah. so, so, so those are very easy as it turns out, and, and, I've, and I've, done, I've done web sockets, and I've done HT, you know, TP, and I've done a bunch of stuff like that. Um, I, and in fact, my next project, I have to read CAD diagrams. So um, I'm, I'm, work, I'm, I'm working on reading, you know, whatever those are, DCG or whatever, the, the, sort of the CAD drawing files um, is kind of my next project. Um, but uh, um, so what I will say is the, the rule here is, just to, it's, you know, golf has rules. Uh, the rule is you can use anything in your base platform, right? So if I'm writing an iOS app, then I can use whatever's built into iOS. Because right? that's free and it's there, right? So that's not a dependency. Right? If I need to get some other library, then no, right? So if I'm, um, Linux is a little tougher because it's so vague and formless, but it's like a, if I take my standard distro out of the box, right? Didn't turn on any, you know, additional stuff, you know, can I do that? And same thing for Windows, whatnot. So the, the idea is pick your platform, and then, within, and then you, you can only use what's in that platform for your stuff. Different platforms will have different capabilities, but most platforms have built-in you know, HTTP support. So you don't have to write HTTP support at initio, right? So it's, it's not, it's, what was it? Uh, um, um, is Debian a platform for you? I'm or sorry? Is Debian a platform? Or what's a subset of Debian that qualifies the platform for you? Um, you know, it's, um, so I'm not a Debian guy, right? brought me here to argue with Debian people because he figured, you know, different point of view was always good. So uh, I'll, I'll leave that to sort of, you know, the intersection of it, to figuring out how you decide what Debian is. Interestingly enough, I was looking for you know, this thing about like, code size and, and, 
and stuff. So the question on my mind was, and you can Google for this, but, but, but Google doesn't know the answer. It asks in this manner, which is, what is the largest project in terms of lines of code? Right? And the answer, I'd say, you, know, you can't do that, but then what you can do is you can go say, how many lines of code does this project have? How many lines of code does that project have? Et cetera. And so Debian weighs in as the biggest uh, at uh, open source or free software project at, at uh, 85 million lines of code. But I'm not sure, again, how they count that. It might count all of the things that have been packaged. So then you would be counting you know, all the Python source code and all the Postgres source code. So again, I'm, I'm not sure how, how to measure that. But, but what I am saying is, is to approach it in that spirit, which is obviously if you're sitting there and you're going to write this thing and you need some you know, date arithmetic algorithm in your Python code and it's not there and you're going to do a pip install or an app get, you're cheating, right? wasn't there in your platform at that time. So, so, so in Python it's real easy if you have a dependencies.txt or whatever it's called, um, file, uh, get rid of that, um, you know, whatever that is. Um, so in, in any platform, there's kind of a, a cultural sensibility for what's in and what's out. I'm getting flashed. The, you only have 60 seconds, so I'm going to have to say, I don't think there's any way I can answer a question in 60 seconds. I don't know if you've noticed, but when I get a question, I answer it. Um, and, but I am going to be out there for the rest of the day, so if anybody wants to, uh, to, to do more uh, questions, answers, sparring, debate, education, etc. Available for that. That's why I'm here. Thank you so much for coming out and great questions, and I look forward to, to doing more. Thank you. <laughs>